Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. I've met many people during my career, and have spent many hours on stage on and off with these musicians talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. Uh, my, my good friend and great bass sax player and music editor supreme, Mr. Jack Wadsworth. Hello, Jack. Hi, Dan. <clears throat> Fancy yeah. words you're using there. Supreme, well, I like that. <laughs> I just learned it. I'm, I'm taking an night school, so. I see. <laughs> I heard it referring to a butter somewhere, and I thought it would be, anyway, thought it'd be handy to know. I don't think that, boy, it sure looks nice and bright and shiny at your house today. That's good. Yeah, we got uh, nice weather, a little breeze. Uh, let's see, what is it like outside? Well, it's pretty cloudy. Yeah, well, a little blue sky poking through. We actually have rain, which you know is not uh, usual for Anaheim. Uh, so <laughs> that means everybody forgot how to drive, and we find out uh, whose lawn is the most soggy. But that's beside the point. <laughs> Um, so let's start at the beginning again. Uh, where, right. were, where were you born, sir? I was born in Hollywood, California. Wow. I think I even commented on that the first time I spoke with you. Nobody's born in Hollywood, but you are, I guess. It's well, once, once upon a time. That's <laughs> back when Hollywood was a separate little town, uh, and you had to drive through the country to get to Los Angeles. That's true. That's true. That was all farmland, wasn't it? At some point a lot of farmland around. Farmlands and... Uh, there's a lot of empty lots in uh, every city block. And did you have a school close by when you started going to school? Yeah, I was about uh, five blocks, I think, from my grammar school. Went to Van Ness Avenue Grammar School, which is Van Ness and Clinton Streets, which is uh, the nearest main drag to that is Melrose. It parallels Clinton. Yeah, it does anyway, look, it does look. then I went to uh, Bancroft Junior High and then to uh, Hollywood High School. I was going to say that, that area went, doesn't quite look the same. No, <laughs> not, not the least bit. Yeah, I remember you telling me that you were a, Holly, you were a Hollywood High chic. I was, although uh, I was a Fairfax colonial in the 10th grade. Uh -huh. And then in the 11th grade, I moved to, uh, to another place and uh, went to Hollywood and graduated from uh, our class graduated in Hollywood Bowl. Wow. Kind of a nice, nice uh, venue. And then I went to LA City College for a couple of years. And uh, after that, I went to work for a while. And Uncle Sam decided that he wanted me for the Korean affair. And so well, I spent some time with the Air Force. Well, let's not, too came back and, let's not get too hmm? far ahead of ourselves here. I, 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 I went to UCLA wanna... and that's it. <laughs> Ta-da! I know. Oh, I know okay. you. I know that's where you met your wife was UCLA. That's true. And uh, and uh, but I want to go back to your very first musical instrument that you put your little grimy hands on. And what was that? Ooh, we had uh, several musical instruments around the house, and the first one was one that we kept on top of our upright piano most of the time. So I had to be tall enough to reach that before I played anything. But it was a little banjo uke. Oh. With, with the, and it was a, a, a nice oldie, actually I guess it'd be a classic today with the old skin head on it. Yeah. But uh, I, I learned a few chords on that. Uh, when I was eight years old, I got the urge to want to blow a horn. And we had a saxophone in the house, so my dad gave me a couple lessons on that. So he's been a professional player. Oh, okay. And, and uh, that didn't take too well. I had trouble with a high G sharp, and uh, we didn't get along at all. So we put the horn away for a few years till I got a little older. <laughs> now, was, was your mom musical also? Uh, she sang some, and uh, when nobody was listening, she'd play uh, some on the piano. But uh, essentially, um, 
I would say no, most of the time not. Although when we drove places in the car, um, there wasn't much on radio at that time, if you even had a radio in the car. So uh, my dad and mom would sing. She'd, she'd sing the melody and dad would, would sing harmony. So at an early age, I got used to hearing that kind of a sound and kind of picked up an ear for harmony. Uh, now, did you join in on the singing eventually? Oh, no. Uh, not until I got good enough to carry a, a good pitch. I, I could listen, but uh, I was not a participant. I, I was wondering if you tried. You know, kids will normally try. Um, well, not, not with the folks, no. Uh, so when saxophone, I, when saxophone didn't take, what did you do? Uh, I went out and played football. <laughs> in, the, in the street with the other kids. <laughs> but when I was 11, all I wanted for Christmas was piano lessons. And so uh, worked out an agreement with my folks that I had to uh, do my practice every day, no matter how hard it got, and keep my uh, grades up in school. And so they agreed to uh, give me piano lessons. We had a teacher that lived a couple of blocks away who was teaching several of the kids in uh, my uh, sixth grade class. So I became one of them and uh, took classical lessons for about four and a half, five years from her. Could have gone further if I hadn't been so lazy. <laughs> you know, that makes you that makes rather unusual uh, because most kids have to get forced to take piano lessons. And uh, Well, this is true. Uh, I hear a lot that a lot, but uh, I really wanted to learn to play. And uh, I had an excellent teacher who uh, would let me try to learn what we called at that time popular pieces as well as classical. So it kept me interested. So she didn't just sit you down and make you play out of the Shermer book for 14 years no. or whatever? No, although I still have my Hannon book. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so you, eventually you ended up on a, on a wind instrument. When did that happen? Oh, when I was in junior high, uh, I took instrument class in the seventh grade as one of my elective classes and learned to play the string bass. In the meantime, the urge to blow a horn came back. And in the eighth grade, I switched and uh, over the summer, I had uh, gotten out the saxophone again and uh, had come to grips with a high G sharp. So uh, in the eighth grade, I joined the school band on saxophone. Did you, ever find it, did, did you ever find out what the problem was with your high G sharp? Was it you, or was it the instrument, was it? Well, uh, I think the instrument had a leak at that point that made it difficult. That's what I was thinking. And the rest, so. of, and the rest of it was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had a leak, no. it's. <laughs> I just didn't have the chops. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, now when you were playing string bass, was that strictly in the orchestra? That was an instrument class. It was like kind of like a pre-orchestra. Okay. We had uh, kids in there on uh, all instruments, violin, cello, string bass, clarinet, trumpet, trombone. We yeah. had one kid in there who played trombone who was very loud. We called him Blasting Buster. But anyway, I, I learned how to finger a string bass and play it. Well, I just and, remember uh, when, when I was coming up that strings got to start in fourth grade, but the brass couldn't start until fifth grade. Well, that could be, but this was seventh grade, so okay. we were clear of that. <laughs> we didn't have any instrumentation or inst instrument class in grammar school. Okay. So, so okay, so we're, so we're going to the high school now as a sax player. Well, as a sax player, but still as a piano player. And uh, actually, I didn't take any uh, music classes in, uh, in high school until my senior year when I, uh, I took a harmony class. But you aced. And, uh, well, I didn't know what I knew and what I didn't know. <laughs> and the teacher was an excellent teacher who uh, said, uh, we'll try to fill in the holes. And she did a wonderful job, uh, learned formal harmony. She also let me try more modern harmonies as long as I did the regular work first. So I had to learn to uh, harmonize in traditional four-part harmony. But then if I wanted to add a sixth or a ninth to a chord, why uh, she let me do it as long as I did it properly with proper voice leading and uh, 
I followed all the rules. Wow, so it was, a, it was very good learning. I was gonna say and that's she also a taught us, what? I was gonna say that's a rare teacher. It is. And what, what she gave us was also uh, various ways of calling chords. So I learned a uh, uh, figured bass system. I learned the uh, Carolyn Alchin system of calling chords. And uh, then I also knew just the way of reading off of sheet music, how the chords are written. So uh, it didn't bother me, whoever I ever played with after that, however they wanted to call chords, it was fine with me, I understood. So it gave me a good lead. That's really, that's very, that's very cool. You know, uh, how fortunate it is that you had a teacher that took what you knew and, and moved forward with it. That's wonderful. By my senior year, I started playing with uh, various bands, kids performing bands. And there was uh, a, a lot of playing available at the time, including the uh, Hollywood Canteen and the USO in Hollywood and uh, school dances, country club dances, it was all kinds of things. And so I was playing with a group, uh, this seven piece group, uh, three saxes, trumpet, and three rhythm. And I was the piano player. And uh, do, you, do you remember the name of the group, of, for chance? Jim Knight and his Noteman. <laughs> okay. I do. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I was with, with that band for, I guess, a couple of years. Then I got to playing with other groups and as the telephone rang and somebody says, hey, I understand you need piano. I need a piano player for Tuesday night or Saturday night or whatever. And so I would, would uh, play with a lot of different groups. And uh, tenor bands were coming into uh, popularity also at that time. So I played with some of those. I don't know if you remember the tenor bands. Three tenor saxes, sure. that, was, that was your front line. Yeah. And then uh, uh, probably piano and drums and maybe a bass. Now I was gonna ask you, in, in, in those type of bands or in those days, uh, were you really uh, strictly written out parts or were they already, were you already getting thrown je uh, just chord symbols and lead sheets at you? Well, with Jim Knight and his Noteman, I was strictly reading the notes until one night at rehearsal, uh, Jim stopped us in the middle of a number and he says, Jack, we've played this tune a lot of times now. He says, you got to know it. He says, fill in the in stuff. He says, it, uh, don't just stick to the notes. So I had to learn what to do to uh, back a band. And uh, that grew. The more I played, why the more I learned how to play. And I did a lot of listening to see what real piano players did. And uh, so, Music to me was, uh, I mean, playing was just uh, music. We didn't call it any particular type of thing. Although most of it, I guess you would say in retrospect, it was society dance type of stuff that I was doing at the time. But uh, it was up to the piano player to fill in the holes and uh, support the harmonies and the rhythm. Right. So it, it really didn't matter if we got into uh, other kinds of jazz, uh, even the one that you tell me we can't say anymore. <laughs> We can say it. It's just not looked on. Uh, looked with well, favor, you know. It's it. We, let me we, let me put it in, in the words of my my uh, uh, music teacher in in uh, high school that uh, what it was was uh, three part improvised free voice counterpoint in a theme and variations format, <laughs> A.K.A. Dixie. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that uh, because of uh, some some people who were asking, we actually turned the tables and Bob Ringwald uh, interviewed me uh, for this show. And uh -huh. uh, at the end of that interview, he says, I still like to call it Dixieland. I said, okay, Bob, that's, you know, that's your right. So uh, we, we, right. We, 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 we can definitely say it. Um, well, anyway, I was, just curious, was, whatever. I was gonna say one of the things that, that drives me crazy is that we haven't standardized chord notation. Well, there's a lot of different types of chord notation. And uh, still, chords are basically built off of a, a root third and fifth of the scale that the chord is in. If you're playing a, uh, in uh, the key of C, you're, you're working out of the C major scale, and you've got a root third and fifth uh, scale degrees. 
uh, that's your basic chord. And to yeah. that, you can add other things, and yeah. then you can alter the notes in it. Yeah, what I meant was, is that the way that people not notate them, for example, there are two or three different ways I know of for notating a major seven. There are several ways I know of half diminished. Some people use a half diminished, which, of course, doesn't really exist. Or there are different notation forms for, for the term diminished. Uh-huh. So th that's what I was basically referring to, is the way that people actually no notate them. Uh, is what drives me nuts. You go from from a published chart to a published chart to a fake book to another published chart, and they all uh, refer to the extensions differently. Well, as a bass player, you you got an edge on that. All you have to do is find where the root is. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> let, let let the other guys worry about the other alteration notes. <laughs> and of course, if you're going to get fancy, why? Uh, you can play the fifth uh, as a ch change off, except you better watch out whether it's a flatted fifth or uh, or not. Well, and it also has a lot to do with how you, uh, in our style, in, in uh, Disneyland music or trad jazz music, for the bass player, um, the choice of whether or not you're going to use a dominant seven leading down to a four chord or, or a major seven and how the, the chords are leading uh, is really kind of an important thing. It's a hard thing to teach uh, a beginner. Well, uh, that's good for the inner voices, but for, for the bass part, you want to stay pretty basic, which is essentially root and fifth. Uh, let the other instruments worry about uh, the uh, color notes but, in the chord. So speaking about bass, who, uh, what in the world got you onto bass sax? Oh dear, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the bands that I had uh, gotten a call to play with uh, was trying to emulate uh, Red Nichols and his Five Pennies. Red was currently playing up on Hollywood Boulevard at that time. And uh, the leader of this little group was a drummer who had become good friends with uh, Red's drummer, Raleigh Culver. And uh, the drummer's name was uh, uh, Ronnie Webb. And he, he was quite a, a talented fellow. I'm surprised I haven't heard more of his name down through the years. But uh, anyway, Ronnie had, uh, with his uh, schoolmates, had formed a band and they needed a piano player. Somebody gave them my name and so that's how I got with the group. Well, they were using a uh, baritone sax in place of the bass sax, which uh, was kind of a hallmark of uh, Red's band at that time. Red was using Joe Rushton on bass sax. Well, I went up to hear the band and I was very intrigued with Russian and what he did with that instrument. I was just completely awed at it. And it just kind of grew on me. Oh, over the years, I kept thinking about bass sax and you know, that really sounds like, and it looks like it would be a fun instrument to play. <clears throat> I didn't know how heavy it was at the time. <laughs> it does weigh 25 pounds. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I waited I one time to find out. <laughs> I think I well, mentioned, that's a, but that's I at I the beginning of the period. Before that, that, that I had. Oh, I'm getting an echo from this. But I, I think I mentioned you once before. I played bass sax for about a year. I borrowed a sax from Ralph Reynolds and tried my hand at it. And yeah, that's not a physically fun instrument necessarily. Well, I had to play it in a, a marching parade one time up in Solvang. And we only had marched at about two blocks. But uh, carrying that thing on the neck strap and trying to play it for two blocks. I, I felt like the hunchback at Notre Dame at the end of the, of the two I, I blocks. Al I always marveled at the bass sax players in the in the sax quintet at Disney for that reason. Yeah, I, I'm amazed. Uh, have you ever noticed how husky the bass sax player is? He's a good brawny guy. <laughs> he needs to be. Uh, it's always been difficult to find what kind of uh, support to use. Um, seems to me Paul Waltz used uh, two snare drums snap, uh, snapped across his chest to support the bass sax when he had to stand or uh, play it other than sitting down. And uh, I find that uh, playing off a neck strap is almost impossible. And I, I tried shoulder harness and uh, the weight of the horn just keeps caving me in where I'm just all <laughs> folded in on myself. So I got the, uh, an upright stand. And I've always uh, 
who played it off of the stand. And we found out that uh, from a, just a plain show standpoint, that it also shows very well, that it makes the instrument look even more immense than it is. Uh, so with the Great Pacific Jazz Band, I always played it off of a stand-up stand. Now, did you start on piano in that band, or did you start right on bass sax? Actually, that band started as part of our uh, uh, noon jam sessions that we used to have a couple days a week at Disney Studios. Uh, Disney Studios was uh, very into uh, supporting uh, activities like that, uh, anything creative. And uh, so they let us use the soundstage for jam sessions amongst the uh, studio people. And then we were permitted to bring in guests from the outside. Oh. And that's how the great Pacific Jazz Band came into being with uh, Roy Brewer and myself, who both worked on the studio lot, and then Don Nelson, who also worked on the Disney lot. Don was playing soprano sax, and uh, I played whatever was needed. If it was a piano that was needed, fine, but by this time I had my bass sax and I wanted to play that. And uh, let's back up a little bit. Bob Ringwald and uh, Zeke Zarchi came in as guests, and it turned out that it was just the five of us most of the time that was showing up for the noon sessions. And so we decided to polish up some tunes and that was the beginning of the uh, Great Pacific. Now I was gonna say, let's go back just a little bit because I'm curious about um, how you got the gig in the first place at Disney as a music editor. Oh, well, at the, I was going to UCLA and uh, had just graduated and gotten uh, a BA degree in music. And uh, because of the way UCLA's music courses are uh, uh, geared, uh, I also wound up with a second, uh, sec special secondary teaching credential in music at the same time. I was geared to go into teaching music. And then I happened to hear about this uh, job opening up at the studios, uh, at uh, Paramount Studios, as a matter of fact. And uh, so I went in and interviewed they liked my music background, says we can teach you the film part of it. But they were concerned uh, that uh, since music editing is kind of a solitary job, uh, whether emotionally I would be able to handle it or not. Being a musician, most of them are so outgoing and all. So just no. living alone in a closet all day is uh, <laughs> not that bad. Well, I assured them that uh, uh, I was glad to be in the back row of the band, not the front row, you know, supporting piano player, uh, it, this was long before bass sax. So uh, anyway, uh, I got the job and uh, uh, until I had applied for it, about a week before I'd applied for it, I never even knew there was such a job as music editing. But after uh, learning what it, what it entailed, it just uh, appealed to me. Yeah, could you, could you say I applied for it and uh, got accepted. Could you tell the, my listeners what it entails, what, what being a music editor or music supervisor entails? Well, in a nutshell, it uh, covers the uh, mechanical uh, part of uh, putting music into any and all of our productions, whether it's for feature movies, TV shows, or uh, other music uses that studios get into, um, which means that I don't have to rely on my performance ability. Uh, I take the recorded tracks after they have been recorded, although I've been in a supervisory role uh, while being recorded as to whether we can use the, the takes that we've just laid down or not, and combining them when necessary to get all the clams out of the music so that uh, when you hear the music in a movie, everybody plays flawlessly every time. If you can hear anything where I've done a cut, I didn't do my job right. But if you say, well, what do they need a music editor for? That place was fine that I did my job right. <laughs> well, but doesn't that mean you have to really work closely with uh, both directors and composers? Yes. Yeah. Um, after a, a film has been uh, edited picture wise and they've got the basic soundtrack and the picture the way the uh, producer and director want it, then they turn it over uh, for post-production work 
which uh, would be for music, dialogue, replacement, uh, where uh, maybe an airplane flew through while they were shooting the scene and the, they have to take that out and replace the dialogue, that sort of thing. Or they want a different reading on a, a line, that's also dialogue replacement. But for music, uh, we determine, uh, we do what we call spotting, the uh, composer, producer, director, and the music editor. We sit in a screening room, run the show, and uh, it's determined where they want music in the show. Uh, the producer's taste, the musician's uh, input, and the director's taste is all taken into account. The music editor keeps track of, of all this. Then uh, it's uh, when the, uh, we, we've determined where we want music in the show, where we don't, what we want the music to say at this particular point, what we want the music not to say at another area and so forth, get all those, those details worked out. Then it's time for the composer to go to work. So it's up to me to prepare the film for him to give him the necessary props. If he wants to play a, a particular scene at a given tempo, uh, I will work out uh, what we call a click track. It's like a metronome on film that starts at a given uh, frame in the scene and uh, ends at a certain frame down later in the scene. Right. You normally use a simty track Keeps for that, right? Tempo he wants. Or if the, he wants to do it free timing, I give him visual cues on the film. So a, a lot of it's mechanical. Right. And as I say, I don't have to rely on my music ability uh, or lack of same. Uh, the performance is done by Hollywood's finest, and I get to be there on stage with them and soak it all up. <laughs> and then I take it off to an evening gig somewhere <laughs> and try to emulate these guys. <laughs> well, but uh, for music editing, uh, it's the uh, mechanical end of putting music into our shows. I would guess the, the position would make it... it uh... Not not an artistic endeavor, but like you said, it's strictly mechanical. Uh, you are basically uh, trying well, to... Well, that part of it is. Yeah, but, just... uh, then sometimes, uh, sometimes some uh, project comes up where they want music for a show, but they don't want to hire a composer. And uh, they will either buy the rights to uh, use music for it, or it will, if it's strictly an uh, in-house type of uh, production, uh, we could use music that was pre-recorded for other shows. Right. And then it's up to me to dig into those and see what is uh, of the type that uh, is wanted and create a music score out of pre-recorded music. And the trick there is to make it sound like it was re uh, recorded for that particular show. That, so that, in, in essence, I become the composer. Right. That's what I was just saying. That, that pretty much puts all of the artistic choices into your court. Uh, where the fade out occurs, what the feeling of the music is, whether or not you're going to be uh, portraying the, the scenery or the individual or the circumstance. Uh -huh. That all of a sudden falls into your hands. And sometimes we have to uh, revise something that's already been recorded. One number that we, uh, or one show that we did, uh, it's called Trench Coat. And it was uh, oh, kind of a, a spoof of the uh, whodunit things. Uh, uh, lady secretary in New York uh, fancies herself as being a mystery writer. And so she takes her two weeks vacation. She goes to Europe to soak up the uh, atmosphere that, of the uh, story she wants to write and gets involved in a murder situation that is paralleling the story that she was writing. Interesting show. Margot Kidder uh, was the actress who played the uh, the lead role in that. Anyway, uh, the producer and director could never completely agree, but time was running and they had release dates. And so finally they locked the show down, brought in a composer. He wrote the music for the show. They recorded everything. And then the producer and director went back into it and started to recut scenes. Snip here, a little bit there, transpose footage from this part of the reel to later in the show and just completely messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we've got to release the show again to uh, the theaters and uh, they've, they've messed this whole thing up 
they can't afford to bring back in, nor do they have the time to bring back a composer and rescore the show. So it was up to me to take the existing music that we had and re-edit it, recut it, to match the, the show as it now stood, including music bridges, backgrounds, uh, music behind uh, longer scenes, uh, the whole wall of wax. Are you normally getting this? It was a cutting nightmare, but uh, uh, if you've, Anybody ever wants a laugh or two, why, the name of the show is Trenchcoat. I'll have to take a look at that. I'm, I'm very curious. It was uh, a you Disney have, release. You, you, you never are supplied with scores, though, are you? Uh, what was that? Are you ever supplied with scores to reference to? When you're oh, yes. Of, oh, well, oh yeah. So being able to read music is a big help. I was going to say, if, if you're doing that strictly by ear, that'd be an absolute nightmare. No. Uh, a lot of that is done strictly by uh, ear, uh, but uh, initially when uh, tracking, as they called it, when it started being done, a music director would bring all the scores down with him and he'd say, tell the music editor, now you cut from here to here and then out of this number, we'll, we'll use this part here and then cut from that to this and so forth. And if you did it just like they said, it sounded god awful, <laughs> just <laughs> terrible. And uh, one composer asked me one time. He says, "Why is it it, 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 it on paper it should work?" And I said, uh, "Well, there's a number of reasons." I said, "But uh, would you uh, let me do it music editor's way uh, for this same scene, and then tell me what you think of it? Because it just was not working the way he wanted it." So he says, "Fine." So I ordered up some fresh prints and uh, went to work cutting by ear. And uh, I called him up about uh, an hour later. He says, what you, what's the matter? And I says, it's all done. You want to come down and listen to it? So he came down to my cutting room. He says, what, you're done already? So I felt good about that. Anyway, I played it for him. And I said, now I want you to turn your back. Don't look at the, uh, at the moviola that I'm running this on because I've done a lot of things where I tried stuff that didn't work and I've put it back together. A lot of things that might look like cuts in the film aren't cuts at all. It's just put back together. So I said, L just listen to it. And I says, uh, put your hand in the air every time you hear a bad cut. Okay, so he did. So I ran it for him at the end of the scene and stopped. And he says, well, what'd you stop for? And I says, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, Play it again, he says. So I ran it again. I says, remember, put your hand up every time you hear a bad cut. Turns around and says, I don't hear anything. He says, That's great. So he says, uh, and he, he watched it then against picture and it just played the scene perfectly. So he was very happy. But he says, I've got to bring my scores down and see what you did. So he did, he brings them all down. And anyway, we start out at the beginning and he's following it along. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a minute, wait a minute, where'd you go? What, what, who, how'd you do that? Why'd you do that? <laughs> and, and finally, he just shook his head. And he said, I would never have thought of doing it that way. But he says, next time this comes up, I says, I'm just going to turn it over to you. <laughs> so I felt uh, good about that. But, you... uh, the reason that he was uh, not taking into account was that when you record and uh, end a chord, there is still room tone carrying in the room depending on uh, what the uh, liveness of the room is. Right. And he was looking at it on paper where everything is nice and clean. Not so in the real world. And so that's why some of his cuts didn't work because uh, you'd have the room tone carryover on the outgoing side uh, that suddenly wasn't there on the incoming side of a cut that was clean. Right. And it just sounded like uh, half the orchestra fell off a cliff. Yeah. What's so, in, what's those, are, those are some of the tricks that we had to get around. What's interesting to me, of course, is if you gave that some situation to uh, one of the younger kids that are in film production now or music editing now, they couldn't imagine how to do that with a moviola. That, I mean, digital. I don't has, think they even know what a moviola is. They don't use that <laughs> old fashioned equipment anymore. Digital. <laughs> Digital is such a is such an easy path to, rather than sitting there with a movie OLED and a razor blade and some tape and doing the kind of stuff you were doing at the time. That was life, but that was the only way to do it then. <clears throat> but that uh, inspired all this electronic stuff to be invented. 
Well, of course, yeah. It's it's yeah. amazing. Um, to bring this all around to to jazz, what's interesting is we kind of do the same thing live instantaneously when we're playing a combo jazz. Is 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 try, trying to make things beginning end correctly and making making sense of what the front line is doing and tying the whole thing together. Don't you find similarities yourself? Well, yes, there are. Um, in the most of the jazz stuff that I have played, as I mentioned uh, earlier, tongue in cheek, that uh, it's on a theme and variations format. We have the song that we play. Maybe it's just a 32 bar Pan Alley song. Um, and then we do variations on it. It might be the, uh, two guys playing together instead of uh, three. It might be uh, the whole three part front line. It might be a four part front line if you add a tenor sax or a berry sax to it. Or in some weird cases, a bass sax to it, where the bass plays uh, a la baritone. Um, guys uh, do their own inventive choruses on things, and then you come back, kind of restate the, the tune for the last chorus uh, with some variations, but uh, closer so that uh, the audience is reminded, oh yes, this is the tune that we're playing. So there is kind of a, a, a definite format to it with a theme, variations, then we get back to restating the theme as, uh, when we go out. Um, it's all improvised. So the, the front line, each instrument is playing its own line. The, uh, usually the uh, trumpet is the uh, dominant horn and plays the melody and the clarinet does a, a decorative obligato part above. Uh, the uh, trombone does a different type of uh, uh, supporting improvised line below to support. Right. Uh, sometimes they play block harmonies, but a lot of the time not. And the block harmonies depend on how good the guy's ear is for that type of harmony. And then sometimes maybe they'll play block harmony for 16 bars and then uh, go in three different directions again for variety. Uh, then they go uh, individual choruses. Each guy does his own thing. Usually to save chops, the uh, clarinet or reed will, will take the first uh, solo chorus. The trumpet might take the second solo chorus so that he can then rest his chops before the final out uh, ensemble chorus. Uh, trombone will take a chorus, piano will take a chorus, Depends on how much you want to stretch the number. Sometimes it's only half choruses, sometimes full choruses. With the Great Pacific, the scariest thing in using rotating choruses was the way it worked out where uh, Don Nelson on soprano sax would usually take the first solo chorus. Uh, Zeke would uh, play the trumpet chorus. Uh, before we had piano, why it was just the trombone would take a chorus and then it was the bass sax which had me in rotation following Bob Havens. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's a piece of cake. <laughs> so I would he, say. He never plays anything good. <laughs> Havens would, would, everything he played, he, he owned no wrong notes. <laughs> everything he played was marvelous. And then I, I'd have to come up and, and, and follow that with the bass sax. I said, well, here we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. But I'll tell you, it was a real challenge to uh, try to come up with something that wasn't just completely uh, terrible. You, you find it really stepped up. It really stepped up your game. It did. It stepped up my game tremendously. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, I owe a lot of my jazz abilities to listening to Bob Havens. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good thing. I think that's good. Thing. Tell me what are the what are the different challenges between being a piano player in that band or being a bass sax player, not necessarily in Great Pacific, but in that kind of ensemble in general? Well, as a piano player, um, you're playing bass, but trying to uh, uh, not get in the way of a bass player if you have one. You're, you're supporting the rhythm, so you're playing, uh, you know, bass chord, bass chord. Bass chord. Uh, you're supporting the harmonies, uh, as to uh, however they happen to go. And uh, then you're doing fill-ins behind uh, where, where needed so that it, it, 
there isn't a big musical hole when somebody plays a half note or a whole note. Um, and it's up to your inventiveness and uh, capabilities as to how good you are at uh, doing those kind of fills and, and like that. You listen to uh, some of the stuff that Teddy Wilson has done, one of my favorite guys to listen to, and it's just marvelous, the fills, they just fit, it's just, the tune wouldn't be right without them. And yet, uh, it's it definitely Phil, it's not the tune itself, because Benny Goodman had the lead. <laughs> right, right. Amazing. But, uh, uh, with, the, with the bass sax, I'm a bass instrument primarily, and a, 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 a reed tuba, if you will. But I also am a baritone sax. Right. Which puts me in the role of a second trombone, maybe, or in place of a trombone, if there isn't a bone in the, uh, in the particular band. So I'm wearing different hats all the time. And yeah, uh, I you have to bass listen bass to the band, what's needed. <laughs> I always thought that bass excellent has a little bit of a uh, advantage in that, uh, over, say, over tuba, for example, is that you can get away cleanly with playing a little more busy. Uh, you're, you're filling your lines and your voice leadings that you're doing as a bass player uh, can be a little more elaborate than they can on, on a tuba. Uh, and For soloing, yes. That's one of the things, I, that's one of the things I've always really envied about being, uh, playing bass sax, why it appealed to me when I tried it, was after listening to Adrian Rolini and the kind of stuff that he was pulling off, it just made me fall in love with those kind of lines. And I get in a lot of, I get in a lot of trouble trying to play them on tuba. <laughs> this is true. There are lines that are, are geared for his particular instrument. And uh, Rolini is uh, a master of playing the right note at the right time and not playing too much. Uh, I talked with Joe Rushton one time. I uh, was admiring his, his uh, dexterity in playing. He made it that right face that only Joe could make. And he says, nah, he says, I play too many notes. He says, Rolini, he says, Adrian Rolini is the guy you want to listen to. And after listening to Rolini, I could hear what Joe was talking about, but that didn't lessen my admiration for Joe any. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, the two different guys playing two different styles. And yes, Rolini is a busy, uh, is a uh, uh, much, he, he uses uh, a lot fewer notes. Uh, Rushton is more of a converted tenor sax player, it seems. And uh, I can hear where he says he's playing too many notes. Joe does play a lot of notes, but they're all the right ones again at the right time. But Rolini's lines are simpler and just the right thing for the music he's playing. And uh, uh, I admire that very much. And I've tried to emulate both of those guys in my own play. I feel if I play something that sounds a la Rolini, ah, I think I did something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I, and if it doesn't sound like Rolini, it doesn't sound like Rushton, yeah, that sounds like Jack Wadsworth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, Jack. It just means it's, a, it's individual. Uh, Everybody's probably his own worst critic on his own instrument. It's it's funny as you're as you're thinking as as we're talking in this entire interview, I was thinking about uh, the juxtapositions between bands that are reading bands necessarily and bands that are get on stage and wing it bands, and uh -huh. and I realized as I was thinking through that process that a lot of the the bands I really like are guys that have just been together forever. Uh, that, can, that, that don't necessarily have charts, but they know each uh -huh. other so well that it sounds like they have charts, if you know what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, and I think that sometimes the charts sometimes end up sounding too contri contrived. The, uh, the Great Pacific, again, was a mix of the two. We started out uh, with everybody trying to play the same tune and each doing his own part. But when uh, we picked up Jim Turner as our piano player, Jim was also a fine arranger. And he did uh, some uh, Louis Armstrong Hot Five and Hot Seven takedowns for us to incorporate in our book. So we both read and uh, improvised. With Jim's uh, arrangements, we read. With other tunes like uh, uh, Oh Baby or something like that, why it was just everybody knows the tune and we played period. <laughs> right. But uh, Jim did some marvelous takedowns uh, on the recording, the one and only recording that the Great Pacific Jazz Band made. 
It's called uh, Great Pacific Jazz Band, The Music of Louis Armstrong. And we did all Louis type uh, recreations. Zeke did a marvelous job on trumpet. And on that particular recording, if anybody has it. I have it. Uh, or, well, take a look at one band in particular. It's called Weatherbird. The, the whole band took a break on that, except for Jim and Zeke. It's just trumpet and piano. And it's a recreation of a thing that done by Louis Armstrong and Earl Father Hines. It is fabulous. It's worth the price of the whole recording. Cool. And we, we laid it down uh, in studio. And Zeke says, this is too hard. He would never play it after that. I think he played it once or twice on a job. Other than that, he says, no way. <laughs> it's just too difficult. But uh, the recording came out great. And uh, I highly recommend that particular band above all others. Well, you know, it seems, it seems like about maybe once a year or, or once every two years or so, I get a chance to play with you again when you're down in the area uh, visiting somebody or another. And uh, I hope we get the chance to do that again. Well, I hope so too. Uh, we've we've done that with uh, Phil Andrine's uh, Crown City Jazz Band, and uh, Phil has always been very kind. Whenever I've come to town, he's he's found a place on the stand for me uh, at Burger Continental when he was there, and then uh, there was uh, I've forgotten what that last gig was. We we the two of us played together. Uh, what was it out in Garden Grove or right. somewhere <laughs> in that area? And you were on tuba, and I was on soprano sax. And uh, behind Carol's vocals, I moved to the piano. And I think we had I think we had Vinnie Armstrong, didn't we? No, not on that one. Oh, okay. We didn't use a we didn't use a piano except behind Carol. Then I moved across, and the uh, the piano was clear across the stage, away from the tuba. Okay. You you were sitting at the band's extreme left. I remember. The piano now. was at the band's extreme right. <laughs> Phil was kind of in the middle, Brilliant. Bob, Bob Dennis and myself. Brilliant staging. Well, listen, sir, I'm going to have to wrap this one up. Thank you so much for doing it Bye. again. And, uh, You're and, welcome. Uh, uh, please stay in touch. Um, if there's anything ever I can ever do for you, whether it's just a phone call to chat or, or a shoulder to cry on, uh, I'm, I'm available. Great. I appreciate that. And hopefully when uh, our current pandemic is over and I can travel again and uh, come back down to LA, well, maybe we get on the same stand and have some fun again. I hope so, sir. You take care now. Play. Okay. Oh, and one thing I was going to mention on bass. Please. Uh, you have an advantage with your tuba. The, the, the bass sax may be more technically uh, flexible, but the bass sax range ends at a concert A flat. And you can go down below that, and I envy you that low G, <laughs> G flat, and F. <laughs> well, <sighs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead and glow with that. <laughs> All right, sir. You take care now. Okay, Dan. Take bye -bye. care of yourself. Right. Bye. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz today. Dan shows new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.